Good evening, everybody who are watching this program from India, and good morning to those who are watching it from the United States. Welcome all of you to the live program number 114 at Orthopedic Principles. We are back with our fantastic faculty, Dr. Uma Srikumaran from the John Hopkins School of Medicine, Baltimore, United States. Dr. Srikumaran is the Associate Professor and Director of Shoulder Surgery at the John Hopkins School of Medicine. He earned his MD from the John Hopkins School of Medicine and completed his residency in orthopedic surgery at the same institute. He performed a fellowship in shoulder surgery at the Harvard and Massachusetts General Hospital, followed by which he got appointed as assistant professor in John Hopkins. And he's been working at John Hopkins since 2011. This is the second lecture with us. And his first lecture was on going green in shoulder surgery, which was well received by the audience. And today he's going to talk a lot of innovative stuff on proximal humerus fractures. Leave it, fix it, or replace it. Over to you, Dr. Sri Kumar. Thank you, Dr. Gopal, and again for the kind invitation and opportunity to present today. We'll be talking about proximal humerus fractures and really how to decide what to do with them. It's quite a complex injury and a lot of uh, thoughts and controversies on our approaches, whether um, operative or non-operative. So first, uh, my disclosures are listed here. Uh, we'll be talking, generally speaking, about the algorithm of how to think about this fracture pattern, but we will also talk specifically about some innovative uh, approaches for fixation and replacement. And uh, I am a consultant for Conventus and FX Shoulder, which I will show some products uh, about today. So the principle here is this is a very complex fracture um, in varying different individuals uh, throughout the age spectrum. And the question always starts with what should we do with this patient and this fracture pattern? Do we leave these alone? There's a lot of evidence to suggest that that might be the appropriate approach for the vast majority of individuals. Should we fix it and or do surgery at all? And if we don't fix it, are we planning on replacing it? And then finally, is there a, a place for referring it to if it's not a common condition that you treat? Should these be passed along to trauma centers uh, and so on for uh, final fixation or consideration of the, the treatment? And that's kind of what we will review today. So the issue at hand is the variation of this uh, fracture. It's not simple. Uh, there can be metadiapsial extension, different varying forms of angulation and displacement. So what does the evidence suggest? The whole point, it seems, of this orthopedic principles forum is to use the evidence available to us uh, to make good informed decisions for our patients. So the, the symbol there is that pyramid of the levels of evidence and how we can go from that and, and learn and apply them to day-to-day -day, um, clinical care. But the problem in this situation is that when you look up the evidence, uh, this is the proximal humerus fractures typed into PubMed, you get hundreds, thousands of results. So this was in December of 2019. And you can see the search results are 3,556, right? So it's a tremendous amount of literature on this topic. And then I updated uh, to include today, July 2020, and the number of cases has gone up even further, 3,784, uh, not cases, but um, papers about uh, this topic and how to manage this injury. So when then we look to a different source of information, ortho evidence, another website, that has uh, done well to uh, take this information, these individual papers and synthesize it and provide higher levels of meta-analysis and systematic reviews and uh, try to come up with more summarized uh, uh, approaches and evidence, right? Even that, when you search for proximal humerus fractures, 1,289 different uh, articles that uh, are available. So uh, using this uh, pyramid, Again, the sort of the logo for orthopedic principles here, uh, slightly different, but there's a pyramid of evidence that we have to consider, you know, starting at the bottom with opinions and basic textbooks or uh, clinical thoughts, advancing to case reports, small case series of different approaches or technologies for a uh, particular condition, 
and then higher level studies of reviews of the literature, uh, maybe critical appraisals, and then more importantly, compared to case series, which have no control group, we started getting into higher levels, including case cohorts, control studies, and even a randomized control study to help us understand uh, what the evidence is uh, for each particular approach. Then we can get summaries of these evidences and guidelines produced by different societies or institutions that help guide things. And finally, meta-analysis and systematic reviews, taking a statistical approach and combining all the data to inform our approach. And then the Cochrane Institution is very good at taking all of that and putting out summary documents of this. So what does all of this have to say in, with respect to proximal humerus fractures? On average, if you consider the non-operative side of things, these are a couple different papers for non-displaced or minimally displaced uh, fractures, and then even some displacement, you can consider an average results of constant scores or patient reported outcome scores approaching 70 out of 100, uh, which are fair. And, dis and when you consider more displaced fractures, those results are uh, less, you know, 61 or average. Uh, the complication rates are still pretty high, 13% dealing with things like varus malunion or avascular necrosis, but there's a high union rate even for non-operative care. And the operation rate from that approach is, uh, is only 6%. When you look more specifically at it, however, at the three and four part fractures, which often do get treated surgically, uh, for whatever reason in this study, by due to their health, an anesthesia score of four, or they just refuse surgery and you follow them, Again, they have a lower constant score of 40 to 85 range and high complication rate. So when we consider non-operative cares, why is this evidence so complicated and confusing? Why is there still controversy about whether we should do this uh, non-operatively or approach this surgically? And how do we come to that decision? One of the difficulties is that the, uh, this fracture pattern is very difficult to research and comparing things, uh, you wanna do so between like groups and often, when we look at this fracture pattern, it's quite complex, the, they're varied. And often we may not be comparing apples to apples and instead we're comparing two different animals of a fracture pattern. Uh, the classification is unclear, it's unreliable. It's been demonstrated that different people will look at, use the same classification and come to different uh, understandings. So that makes it even more difficult and to understand what we are looking at. And that's just the fracture. What about the patients, right? There's a wide spectrum of patients, age, health, demands, and uh, they're all very different. They may all have different outcomes for a very similar approach. And then it's challenging, it's difficult to treat. It's not just a bony injury, right? So the soft tissues are also damaged and that can affect things like range of motion. Uh, and those are things to consider surgically as well as in our non-surgical conservative approach with respect to how we uh, evaluate and recommend physical therapy and how we advance motion and so on. And then the, our own experience, our training and background come into play. Are we a trauma surgeon, a special, subspecialist or a shoulder surgeon? How does that influence uh, what we're doing and how we present options to patients? And then not only the surgeon, but also the technology uh, that's available, right? different locking plates, new cages, reverse arthroplasties. These are all some new things that are coming into play that make our decision-making even more complex. So the issues remain that because of substantial variation in the fracture pattern itself, as well as patient characteristics, as well as perhaps our own selection bias, we have a lot of different things to consider. So even meta-analyses and randomized controlled trials considered higher level evidence. When you combine all these different things and put them into one group, you tend to have a bias towards the null hypothesis, meaning that things are all the same. So we've heard it before and we can see it in the literature that non-operative is not much different than operative care. So if that is the case, why are we doing surgery for uh, large numbers of these patients? But really we, what we need to move towards is subgroup studies that are large, uh, you know, four part only, studies that are just valgus that, uh, you know, isolated age group that are, have high demands. What is best for that group? There are very few studies, if any, that can do this type of isolated analysis. And that's what makes it difficult. It's a very difficult study to do. It's hard to get the numbers to get statistical significance and so on. So that's why they don't exist uh, in large uh, quantities right now.
Another study might be just four part fractures in 70, over 75 year olds that are low demand. Clearly the results of those two types of studies for the same fracture pattern might be quite different. So we need to consider other things as well. The final outcomes are interesting, whether that's a patient reported outcome measure or whether that's union of a fracture, but other outcomes may be very important to the patient. The amount of pain that one has in that early period right after the fracture for the first six weeks or three months, is that an important consideration for a particular patient? And how does that play into our decision making? Uh, that's important. So when we look at this problem, there's a lot of different factors that we talked about. There's minimally displaced uh, fractures here on the left, greater displacement uh, in various angulation here. Then we have to consider the different technologies that we have, pinning, plating, use of adjunct cement, use of arthroplasty, different new technologies, cage and reverse. And we consider our patients, are they old and frail? Are they more active and demanding? Do they, are they active in, in terms of athletics and sports and leisure activities? Uh, and then our own biases, what is our training and experience? Where are we in the world? Are there some biases from North America versus Europe or Asia and so on? But if you take all these different things and do a simple study or try to gather it all, you're really putting it in this blender and that often turns into something that doesn't look very appetizing. What are you supposed to do? This it doesn't look particularly you know, tasty. It's not interesting at all. So how do we move on from this? How, do, how can we go on and what should we consider? So we'll take a systematic approach here on how we come up with an algorithm for this problem. What are the factors to consider? First and foremost, of course, is our patient. And then we might consider other things like the fracture, which is what we like to do as orthopedic surgeons is look at the x-ray and then attempt to decide uh, what we're going to do. And then we have to consider our own bias and our own approach. And then finally, the technology that's available to us, what might be available to someone in Europe or North America may not be available or applicable uh, to someone uh, in Asia or South America, for example. Even within the United States, there are certain areas that have technology or healthcare payers or systems that are willing to pay for certain technologies uh, versus not. So that's another important consideration. So there's a complex interplay here between all these factors and ultimately it will lead to some shared decision making between the particular surgeon and the individual patient. So let's start first with the patient. What things do we consider? Of course, things like age, but not just uh, physiologic age, but cr or chronologic age, we have to consider physiologic age, right? Uh, what their demands and activity inform us about uh, what they might expect in terms of outcomes. So what do they do for work? What are their, what are their leisure activities? Are they right-handed or left-handed? What are the general health, but also what support do they have at home that can help them uh, through the recovery period, whether operative or non-operative? Particular risk factors such as smoking or obesity should be considered and their own individual risk tolerance. We're going to talk about the operative approach has a quite a bit of risk in terms of complications. What is what is their tolerance for that and tolerance for secondary and tertiary type surgeries that are needed to resolve those complications? I think expectations itself is very important, right? We have to manage their expectations and often we will tell patients early on uh, and before and during consideration for a non-operative or operative approach that in general, no matter what we do, whether we leave them in a sling and just do therapy, whether we try to fix this or replace this, uh, sometimes the results end up the same. The amount of range of motion and functional return is uh, has a ceiling. It's not likely that everybody's gonna get back to even 90, 100%. So setting that early expectation that there's a complicated fracture in a complicated area that was likely to have some long-term impact in terms of their range of motion, their strength, their activity level, even though they may be able to achieve pain relief, whether it's um, uh, at the early stage or late stage uh, of the game, whether they can achieve that or not may not be their primary concern. So setting all of those expectations early can be important to how they perceive their outcome uh, in the end. So moving on to the fracture consideration part of the equation. There are several things we consider here that we'll review. So first, the parts and the two velocities that are involved, where, there's, where are they positioned relative to the head and the shaft, the level of displacement of those different parts, their, their particular angulation. Can we attempt to look at factors on radiograph that can predict vascular compromise that might change our decision-making? 
bone quality and how that would affect whether we pursue fixation versus replacement. And finally, associated injuries and fractures. Do they have ipsilateral lower extremity fractures that you may want to allow for immediate weight bearing and how that will come into play. Then moving on to the surgeon, again, our own training comes into play and uh, influences our own bias uh, and experience with a particular fracture. We're all victim to our last complication. And what if that was a result of a non-operative approach, we tend to be biased and think twice again about offering the same uh, approach to our next patient. It's very hard to think globally and using evidence-based uh, medicine and all the literature to for an individual case. We tend to remember most vividly our our biggest complications and that may bias us towards what we offer the next patient. We may also have a bias depending on how we were trained in terms of a trauma approach or a, a reconstruction shoulder surgeon uh, approach. Um, that I'm a shoulder specialist, uh, but often when we consider this fracture or the, or the more controversial ones will work with our colleagues in trauma surgery and get their opinion as well, offer both perspectives uh, for the patient. And then finally, our experience with these different technologies. Simply because a humeral nail works in someone's hand in a particular country does not necessarily mean that it will translate to your own experience and expertise. Uh, so that's something to consider. What are you most comfortable with and what is your greatest experience uh, with a particular technology? And can you reproduce that for all of your patients? And then finally, the healthcare environment. As we spoke about, uh, our geographic location can inform on what payers will, will be willing to pay for particular technologies and what are the cultural expectations uh, for a particular group and are there new or other technologies that are coming into play that which tend to be more costly? Can we consider that? How do we get that approved and how do we incorporate that into offering these options to our patients? So. Generally speaking, we have all these different factors that we've, we've discussed and they're all kind of in our mind when we're trying to divide things initially between non-operative care and uh, an operative approach. So the first things we consider may be patient desire. And in, in general, when we're thinking non-operatively, um, an elderly patient population with minimal displacement and minimal pain is clearly in a non-operative group versus an operative group, much younger, significant displacement or severe pain. But once operative, how do we decide between fixation and arthroplasty, considering the, the look, looking at uh, vascular disruption risk based on the imaging studies. Are they high demand individuals, the younger individuals? That's definitely gonna sway us a bit towards open reduction, internal fixation versus arthroplasty. Maybe our experience as arthroplasty surgeons tilts us to the other side, uh, or if they have high vascular disruption risk or in lower demand or just want a faster recovery, uh, that may tilt us uh, to the arthroplasty side side of things. So let's look at this algorithm. Where do we start? So first we're considering we'll combine patient factors as well as fracture pattern factors. Is the fracture displaced? If it's not displaced, we clearly can take a non-operative uh, approach uh, to, to care, whether young or old, right? However, it gets much more complicated, of course, as this level of displacement has to be considered. If it's very displaced, then we start considering some patient factors such as their demand. If they're low functional demand, a poor medical candidate, high level of comorbidities and so on, or just have minimal pain, a non-operative approach is also appropriate in this case, right? So what does that mean? What does a non-operative approach uh, encompass? First, uh, simple immobilization, simple sling or sling and swath, early range of motion, likely one to two weeks, some good evidence for starting early as tolerated as their pain allows so we can balance the difficulty of the, the bony recovery with the soft tissue issues. Stiffness is an incredible problem, uh, regardless of how we uh, approach it. So early stretching is important with a late strengthening phase. So that's generally what our non-operative approach uh, is. So just a simple example of a minimally displaced fracture into slight uh, valgus, but located and uh, joint well aligned. This is an example for pursuing a non-operative approach. So moving to the operative side of the equation, what pay, uh, fracture pattern factors push us to this side of the arm of the algorithm? So things like tuberosities being displaced greater than five millimeters, right? So, um, significant displacement uh, or varus and valgus displacement that uh, is substantial. And varus is known to be worse than uh, a valgus uh, fracture pattern substantial shaft displacement relative uh, to the head or tuberosities. Uh, 
articular surface displacement, um, two millimeters. So even two velocity displacement, we're considering a shorter tolerance level for two millimeters uh, more recently than previously suggested five millimeter displacement. And then finally, the apex of the fracture pattern may not be tolerated by patients and they may feel it in the subcutaneous tissues and uh, that may force us into an operative uh, arm of the uh, algorithm. So when we look at some of these meta-analyses of a surgical versus non-operative approach, uh, this is a study by Bex that compared both operative and non-operative treatments specifically for older patients over 65 and displaced patterns. So this included seven randomized trials and 15 observational studies, over 1,700 patients, 900 of which were treated operatively, eight, over 800 non-operatively. And they found, again, no structural or statistical difference in functional outcomes uh, between the groups. But there were more interventions, major interventions required in the operative group. Uh, and then fewer non-unions, however, with the non-operative treatment. And then this is a summary of those both observational studies on the top, looking at the difference on this forest diagram and randomized studies on below. So really not a lot of difference uh, between these two when looked at from a meta-analysis perspective. And we can't talk about this topic, proximal humerus fractures, without looking at this PROFER trial performed in the United Kingdom, which looked at randomization, a very high quality trial uh, of 250 adults but only 18 were one part, 128 two parts, and then 104 three or four parts. And they were randomized evenly into those two groups and followed up for over 24 months. And then surgical treatment in this trial as well did not result in a better outcome for most patients. And it was more costly and it had more complications. And this was uh, established as well at a, at a five-year outcome. So you can see the Oxford shoulder score, very similar between groups at all time points. EQ5D, another general health outcome measure, also equivalent across uh, the time points, and SF12 scores as well. But there are some criticisms to consider. So there, even though this was a randomized controlled trial, as we look at this particular level of evidence, there was likely significant selection bias. The study notes that 87 patients, and remember there was only 105 that were considered displaced in the three and four category, 87 other patients were never brought into the trial because they were excluded due to clear indications for surgery. That's due directly from the surgeon's own feeling and unease about their willingness to have that patient randomized into one of the groups. They felt strongly that this was a clear surgical indication. So those were automatically exclude, excluded and brought in uh, outside of the trial. So the generalization of the study may not be uh, appropriate because this complex fracture group was excluded. Again, this is a very tight group. So we don't have just this group being randomized uh, and we don't have that information available to us. So if we get back to our algorithm, how do we incorporate that piece of, of knowledge here? So we've talked about non-operative care, it's certainly an appropriate place for this low to functioning demand person, but also if this, this approach, this immobilization is not well tolerated, there's unmanaged pain or there's worsening displacement or the patient's generally dissatisfied, that's another way to get into the operative arm of the algorithm as we think about this fracture. Um, operatively, we might consider this individual, for example, with this x-ray, some mild to moderate displacement, but the joint is well aligned. He's 82, he had a fall on the stairs, a significant lung disease, so low demand, uh, poor medical candidate, uh, mild, moderate pain. So we did treat this individual with sling physical therapy, but over time, this fracture continues to uh, displace further, and he's not happy at three months. Despite his low demand, he's very unhappy with this result uh, at three months. So ultimately, uh, he was brought into the operative arm of our algorithm. So when we consider the operative arm, we again look at the patient uh, factors. Are, what's their demand? Not just chronical, chronological age, but also their physiological age based on what activities and function they would like to achieve. Is their bone quality good or is it poor? What blood supply do we think uh, remains uh, on, in that fracture area? Is it fixable in other words? If, that's, if your answer is yes, we have a host of options for internal fixation, closed reduction percutaneous pinning, we have humeral nails, we have um, uh, locking plates now, and different combinations of, and uses of adjuncts, so things like fibular struts to help support our fixation constructs, the cage, uh, cement augmentation, different things that we can use 
to achieve a good result. If your answer is no to this question of uh, functional demand or low quality bone or having a poor blood supply, then that may drive you into the arthroplasty arm of this algorithm. And, there's, and just looking at the trends in the United States, how we just decide between non-operative care or fixation and arthroplasty, it varies greatly by geographic region. It's sort of a heat map of where uh, surgery is performed in over 40% of cases in parts of the United States, all the way to less than 10% of cases. So this variation reflects our own surgical training, our biases and patient uh, expectation and interests. Even in the same uh, country, there's quite a wide spectrum and it changes over time. Early in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, the rate was 12 to 15%. And the, the technology probably in, influenced this, the development of locking plates and bringing them on board. Maybe our interest increased for, for some time. If we look at the trends in the Medicare population, so specifically over 65 from 2009 to 2012, we see hemiarthroplasty declining uh, in red here. Open erection internal fixations re remaining pretty consistent and reverse shoulder arthroplasty, a new technology coming into uh, higher incidence over in, into the early 2010s. So we see that rate again hovering around 15%. So if we look, consider this algorithm, we do fully expect on average 85% of, of this fracture pattern is managed non-operatively and only 15% fall into this operative category. And I think that's an important uh, message. So uh, how we look at this 15% and how we divide that up into these two categories, uh, we'll go into a little bit further. So again, this evidence is what supports a large number of these being managed non-operatively with fewer complications, risk of needing further surgery. So let's focus in here on the internal fixation group for a minute. Uh, first, what's the problem now with operative reduction and internal fixation? What are the challenges? And in terms of the technology, we have lots of options, right? We have plates, we have locking plates, we have nails, pins, and all those different uh, adjuncts and different approaches, but it's still uh, difficult to do. It's a challenging fracture uh, for the surgeon. It's hard to get high numbers in terms of experience and volume with all these different approaches when so much is there to choose from. Uh, from the patient perspective, there's a lot of complications we have to deal with. Uh, even, for example, just failure to heal, non-union can be a complication. Uh, loss of reduction, collapse, failure of the fixation or malunion uh, can be a problem. The need for those adjuncts, if, whether it be cement or fibular struts or allografts to help support even the best uh, locking plate technologies uh, is still in use. So even when things heal, uh, we have hardware issues, right? There's need for removal of these plates and screws for impingement or painful hardware screw penetration that gets into the joint and causes significant articular damage. And then there's issues with function and motion. Uh, is that because our construct was inadequate and we were uncomfortable allowing our patient to advance with their motion early? Um, or do we have prolonged immobilization? Because even though we fixed the fraction, we took this patient to surgery, we still couldn't allow them uh, early range of motion. So have we achieved all the goals of our operative fixation? Even when it heals down the road, avascular necrosis, uh, the percentage increases each year after this type of fracture and surgery. Uh, so all of this leads to a high level of reoperations for the operative fixation group and dissatisfied patients. So what are the keys to fixation to try to minimize those issues? Medial calcar support has been shown by multiple studies. We don't need to get into those specific studies, but it's supporting the calcar and the articular block, giving it a wide support to allow it to remain rigid. Having that without just relying on screws and risking screw penetration is uh, important. Endosteal strong fixation, and of course, good tuberosity fixation, good placement of the tuberosities and fixing them rigidly, not just with suture. Uh, can help. It can, you can advance your motion faster. Uh, can you get screws perpendicular to the fracture planes? And this is where you'll see some controversy for humeral nails or other technology versus a two-dimensional plate trying to address a three-dimensional uh, fracture pattern and where locking plates may fall short. So let's talk about this case briefly. A 68-year-old female, three-part, maybe four-part proximal humerus fracture secondary to a seizure has some medical history, hypertension, diabetes, uh, 
uh, type 2 and uh, depression. Uh, of note here, her other side, the right side, has a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty on it. How does that influence your decision making? That the reverse total shoulder does have some limitations uh, with motion. Would you consider more fixation? For us, uh, we did consider fixation. And these are some of the steps operatively uh, that we went through. So first, an accurate reduction, always critical to any type of uh, fracture care prior to fixation. So here you see the fracture reduced uh, with a blunt homen uh, holding the uh, articular surface. And we're considering either a locking plate, you can see in the second uh, image, and either provisionally fixing that or uh, this cage technology with which provisionally fixes the articular portion to the shaft, allows placement of an intra endosteal or intra um, medullary implant that expands and is three-dimensional, then fixing that to the humeral shaft, then fixing our lesser tuberosity fragment from with anterior to posterior screws into the cage, and then fixing our greater tuberosity fragment with screws into the cage. So that's why this looks a little funny and you see screws in all these different directions, but honestly that does make sense, right? Your fracture pattern and fracture lines are in three dimensions and being able to fix rigidly across and perpendicular to those fracture lines can achieve a good result, a good reduction, and a rigid fixation immediately. So we allow early range of motion uh, with this type of technology. Here you can see it after hewing uh, with the cage all intramedullary, so perhaps limiting the risk of hardware complications uh, down the road for this patient population. So what is the ideal technology? Do we have it yet? So this is just an image of why we might consider this type of cage technology to be an advancement of where we've come from locking plates. You can use this in combination uh, as well as uh, in isolation uh, as we will review. So here, this is immediate rigid fixation. We're moving the arm intraoperatively. Because we have this fixation, we're confident about the pieces. We allow for earlier range of motion. So any ideal technology I think would have these characteristics characteristics. It should be flexible. This is a complex fracture, right? It's very different in every case. There's a little bit of additional involvement of the metadiapsal region or extension into the shaft changes how you do things. Um, so you need to have good tuberosity fixation as well. You need a technology that will allow you to do that. Um, maybe these two-dimensional plates sitting on the lateral side aren't adequate enough. You want the technology to assist with your reduction. It's hard to hold this fracture pattern reduced provisionally and get your um, final fixation construct in there, right? So we need something that allows us to do that. We'd like to avoid screw penetration. We need to support the medial calcar, but, and the articular surface with a broad uh, base device and not just screws that are at risk for penetration through the articular uh, surface. Uh, we need a strong fixation in general. So even in poor bone, this happens in osteoporotic elderly individuals primarily. And that has implications as we've been discussing for stability and early range of motion. We wanna be able to maintain biology with minimal disruption to the host, improve our healing rates, and maybe impact avascular necrosis down the road. We wanna avoid the need for adjuncts for things like fibular allografts or cement, things that might be more costly and, and difficult uh, to use. So I think this, this is kind of what we're, we are looking for and need to address the complexity of this fracture pattern. And that, I think, will ultimately lead to decreased reoperations and complications and ultimately improve uh, patient satisfaction. So what evidence do we have for something like this? The CAID is a fairly, probably one of the newest technology for this uh, injury. Um, this is one of the early reports from, from our group, just looking at our early experience, the first 10 or 11 patients with isolated three or four part fractures. Uh, this was published in JCS in 2009. Just quickly though, it's 100% union rate. We did have one AVN that we ultimately converted to a reverse. That was a patient with, uh, who was a smoker. We had one loss of reduction and a malunion. Ultimately didn't want revision, was adequate, uh, was um, satisfied with um, their results, but had a multiple ongoing falls. Um, but, and we didn't have any neurovascular complications in this group. So in that pyramid, this is a very low level study, no control group, right? It's just our initial report of a new technology. But we were able to achieve low pain scores um, and fairly high uh, 
um, subjective shoulder value and American shoulder and elbow scores with reasonable motion. This is consistent with uh, fracture fixation for this, um, this injury in three and four part fractures. So mean abduction was 82, mean forward flexion 123, uh, and external rotation in abduction of 70 degrees. And, and as I said, all final at final radi radiographic evaluation, we had 100% um, healing. And that may be due to just the reaming that you do, and we spread that intermedullary uh, bone across the fracture sites, and it does get very good uh, healing rates. And we didn't have in this early series any wound-related or neurologic complications. But of course, while we did achieve good clinical out outcomes, we did have some complications, and this is a, just a small retrospective study, so we need something longer term and with control groups. Um, but it does lend some information in that we have a useful alternative here, something else to consider uh, for this high risk of mechanical failure or AVN high risk group that when you're looking preoperatively, you might consider as another part of your armamentarium. Or if just for patients that are physiologically or chronologically younger, that arthroplasty wouldn't be advisable. And another paper from Goodnow and Gardner's group uh, also came out in Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2019, a bigger population of 52 pa patients, and they found a very low reoperation rate considering uh, uh, historical controls as well as a low AVN rate considering histor historical controls. But again, no control group. So our evidence remains low for this fairly new technology. So where does it fit into our decision-making remains to be fully determined. So getting back to the algorithm. So we've considered internal uh, fixation. What happens when this stuff fails, when we have failure of the hardware or the reduction or AVN or so just symptomatic issues, then we might consider moving towards arthroplasty as a revision option. And what, what do we consider in this case? Well maybe primary cases as well, head splits that we don't feel that we can fix directly, even in a younger individual or higher demand individual, or a disrupted blood supply that we think is not going to lend itself well to fixation. Um, but there's also a lower demand group uh, with osteoporosis or rotator cuff tear that we may also consider. So in this younger or younger group, higher demand, we, we may consider hemiarthroplasty. Uh, but in this lower demand group, we're more likely these days, uh, especially if you're a shoulder surgeon, to consider a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, but in the hemi group, it's critical to consider the tuberosities. If you can't get good tuberosity fixation, even intraoperatively, you might convert from hemi to a reverse uh, arthroplasty option. Or down the road, if the tuberosities fail to heal or they reabsorb, as we know they do often, that may warrant revision to a reverse arthroplasty. Um, so let's focus in on just the arthroplasty um, part of this algorithm now. So reverse shoulder arthroplasty has been described and considered specifically for proximal humerus fractures, and it can compensate quite well for tuberosity complications, which we know are quite common the restoration of elevation is much more consistent, reproducible, and it can be expected, something that patients may appreciate preoperatively understanding. Uh, the recovery is much faster. You can allow for immediate weight bearing often in, this, in these cases uh, compared to a hemi where we're a little bit more nervous about tuberosity healing. Um, so this is, if we look at trends, RSA has definitely increased for three and four part fractures as primary indication. And using it conservatively for patients with high functional demands is warranted, and these studies have all supported that. So when we look at uh, a meta-analysis, again, moving up the levels of evidence here, specifically at hemiarthroplasty versus reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Reverse total shoulder arthroplasty with respect to all these variables, tuberosity healing, forward elevation, abduction, constant score, DASH score, and ASDS score were significantly better. Only with respect to external rotation did hemiarthroplasty outperform uh, the reverse. So in this study from Galnet as well, demonstrated the uh, same thing. Uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty had higher constant scores, forward flexion, and abduction. But hemiarthroplasties had greater internal and external rotation. And it had a lower rate of complications, but at the higher cost of revision rates. And the constant scores demonstrated here, range of motion uh, here. So rotation much better for hemiarthroplasty. Uh, 
if we look at the trends, uh, reverse total shoulders versus hemi among all surgeons, you see uh, a bump up uh, in the early 2010s. If you look among shoulder surgeons, that's been happening uh, preceding that from 2005 moving forward. As we had this technology first in America, reverse shoulder replacements, we had that early in 2003. Since then, it's been going up uh, for this indication quite steadily. And hemiarthroplasty pictured in the light gray is, is declined quite, quite a bit. So what are some of the advances in arthroplasty uh, fixation? So typically when we use a reverse shoulder replacement, we're often stuck with cementing uh, the stem in or having a press fit option, which isn't always possible for poor bone or metadiaphyseal fractures. So this interlocking option uh, is, is quite attractive to be able to insert your humeral stem uh, provides several advantages to just be able to interlock it without cement. It has a porous portion for ingrowth proximally, but distally we have some interlocking as you can see being performed in the video here with a simple, simple jig through the same deltopectoral incision. So that offers several advantages, immediate rigidity to your construct without the use of cement, an ability to reconstruct different individual parts at a time, uh, the lesser and greater tuberosities. You can adjust the version of the rotation and height of your stem, which is something you want to be able to do in, in a reverse, and you can reduce these complex fractures cases to much simpler individual parts. Uh, so immediate weight bearing as well uh, is, a, is feasible. And you can use it in a non-interlocking press fit fashion as well. So it gives you some, some flexibility. You can just insert it. And if you have adequate fixation in that particular case, you don't need to use the interlocking option that's, that's available. So I found this to be an advance uh, in terms of what I was traditionally doing with the reverse shoulder replacement, which required cement augmentation, which made it very tricky. You had that one chance to get your version in height and rotation correct, and then you bought it with uh, the cement. Here, you can put in one screw, make the adjustments. If you're not happy, you can adjust the height, remove that screw, adjust the height, rotation, and so on. So uh, some additional surgical flexibility is always nice. So this is an 85-year-old um, person that's sustained this fracture dislocation. Ultimately, we treated with this interlocking technology and allowed immediate weight bearing uh, because they had some ipsilateral lower extremity issues and use of a walker. They're able to tolerate that quite well. Two months status post uh, um, surgery walking. Another chronic case, uh, failed non-operative treatment um, performed with this interlocking technology also allowed for some early mobilization and function. So important for the elderly population not to have to wait several months uh, for healing and recovery to get back to their base level activities. So what about acute versus delayed reverse total shoulder replacements as we just demonstrated in these two cases? A couple studies and, and reports that acute, which we define as less than four weeks or greater than four weeks, they had similar clinical satisfaction range of motion outcomes and similar radiographic outcomes with similar complication rates. So it may be reasonable to wait uh, and see if non-operative care fails and then consider a reverse shoulder replacement because of its ability to compensate for uh, lack of tuberosity function. Even though in some studies it will show heightened uh, functional outcomes with tuberosity healing, even in a reverse. So here is ultimately our, uh, our algorithm from non-operative to operative, and then considerations for internal and arthroplasty. How does vascular compromise influence this algorithm? Well, you can see, uh, we look at different places. It may influence, influence us into pushing us into different aspects of fixation. When we consider operative management, if you have a good supply, blood supply, you're more likely to consider an internal fixation. If you have failure of that and avascular necrosis, you're being driven into arthroplasty. Uh, even within arthroplasty, if you have a disrupted blood supply, in terms of fixing it, considering a hemi versus a reverse in terms of your tuberosity healing may also come into consideration. And this uh, paper by Hertel uh, is commonly discussed in terms of being able to predict that ahead of time and humeral head ischemia after these intracapsular fractures. And this is this popularized um, four-part system, but ultimately having an anatomic neck fracture a short calcar, uh, disrupted medial hinge greater than two millimeters, all leads to a higher risk of ischemia with a 97% predictive value. However, the following study, of course, when somebody else tests this in 267 patients, they still had a very low AVN rate and not even 
the cases that had AVN, only 30% had all those predictive factors. And in the group that didn't have AVN, 4.7% uh, had all the predictive factors. So I'm not sure how valuable this uh, consideration is. It's very difficult to use. It's not the, um, even when we consider those different radiographic factors, it may not uh, be possible. And some have suggested it's better to evaluate the CalCal region. So it's a consideration, but I do think it's a bit smaller consideration than uh, much more significant patient related factors are, at least in my approach to this injury. Okay, so back to the operative arm again. What about the surgeon and healthcare environment factors that we spoke of? Are you a high volume surgeon? Uh, do you, are you primarily an operative trauma surgeon? Are you an arthroplasty shoulder surgeon? And is this technology available to you? If the answer is yes, these, these things are available uh, and you can interact with your colleagues and refer particular patterns uh, and so on. But if the answer is no, um, it's okay to refer it. It may be very appropriate to send these patients to higher volume surgeons or centers and educate patients on, on the need to do that. Maybe it's inconvenient for them to travel 50 miles uh, to another center, but it may be well worth their while to do so. Because like I said, as individual surgeons, it's very difficult to get the volume of experience required to have better outcomes for this complex injury. And that's uh, well demonstrated in our literature that uh, surgeon volume is very much associated with cost and variation as well as outcome. So there's lower complications, length of stays and costs with higher volume centers as well as higher volume surgeons. And there's other patient factors to consider, right? So um, how does how you do depend on how you think you'll do uh, has been looked at in a systematic review and patient expectations that we talked about and how that influences patients' outcomes. So patient expectations are important to consider and manage before uh, the decision is made uh, for operative or non-operative or for arthroplasty or fixation. And that can, dem and that can very much uh, help how patients feel about their outcomes, whether their actual objective outcomes are the same. And then there's some individual things to consider, such as obesity um, and other things like diabetes uh, and how that might influence you and decrease your, or sorry, increase your threshold to approach something uh, surgically that may increase your risk of complications. And that's a discussion to have. And it's a little bit more nuanced in that you probably need to look at their hemoglobin A1C and how well controlled their diabetes is. So you're not inappropriately uh, limiting diabetic patients from surgery. So this is the final algorithm that uh, I tend to use to manage this fracture pattern. But as we talked about, some of the evidence uh, still makes it difficult uh, to manage this, even though 85% is in this non-operative half of the algorithm, there's a large percent, there's 15% that still need to be managed. And how can we better um, manage this? Uh, where are we headed? I think we do still need better trials despite the massive amount of literature that exists. We need more informed protocols that tend to look at an isolated group, uh, such as this protocol that's been published by Dr. Lafner's group, that's gonna look at, in a randomized fashion, 160 patients with highly displaced fractures in the particular age group with one technology. So this is a blender of one group of things with one technology. So this is a far more appetizing blend of information that will help guide us uh, in the future. But of course, it's very difficult to do this type of work. It requires large center, um, multi-center groups, uh, lots of numbers and uh, focus and dedication and it costs money. Uh, and that's why there's not a lot of this out there. So it's gonna take us time, but this is the direction we need to go uh, to improve uh, our outcomes. So we have this type of uh, information. So ultimately you must consider the all factors and most importantly, I think the patient, their demands and expectation uh, is, is foremost, but fracture surgeon as well as uh, healthcare and technology availability are uh, important as we come to uh, this pyramid of uh, decision-making. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sri Kumaran for another excellent lecture and uh, which I'm sure is going to change practice for a lot of surgeons around the world. So a few questions. One is regarding the 85-15 rule that you mentioned. I mean, in one of the papers, right? 
85% can be treated conservatively or and 15% can be treated surgically, isn't it? Isn't it like that? So what is it with respect to your practice? Do you, do you find it similar? Uh, yeah, no, I think I'm probably closer to 75%, 25% operative, but it, it just depends. It's just the nature of our practice as a tertiary center. We get more referrals, uh, you know, more cases. But I think of the primary cases that I see in our sort of individual hospital, it is very close to 80-20 uh, split. A lot of these are very low demand individuals, very high comorbidities, minimally displaced fractures, or that can be managed uh, and tolerated non-operatively. So it, yeah, that hurdle to get to the operative group, you know, has to be carefully considered because of all of the risk involved. So, um, you know, it, it's important to see that we see variation, but some of that comes from where we practice, what type of hospital, you know, rural versus urban setting and so on. So, but this is, yeah, overall, if we take everything, it, it's approximately in that range, 80, 80, 20. So the vast majority of these fractures can be treated conservatively. If you're looking at, say, a district general hospital, mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. The other one is uh, regarding a particular procedure. You mentioned about hemiarthroplasty. When you're considering arthroplasty options, either hemiarthroplasty or reverse shoulder, and you mentioned hemi hemiarthroplasty for relatively younger patients. So what is the age group that you consider hemiarthroplasty? If you have a head split say at uh, 35 years of age, mm -hmm. would you consider hemiarthroplasty? Yeah, so even in the 35 is quite young. So there, if you can get even their native head, like a headless screw and you, and, you know, you have two distinct parts and you can fix it, we still favor trying to fix it as we're going to, we're going to take some heroic measures, right, to operatively fix that patient. But uh, if at the time of surgery, um, there's just nothing there. The pieces are too great to actually fix the articular surface portion of uh, an anatomic type fracture, then uh, hemiarthroplasty, I think it would be very appropriate for that 35 year old because very likely the tuberosities are gonna be robust and fixable to the stem that you use. And then the only the head will be replaced with the metal. And that's something that can be converted hopefully when they're 55, 60, potentially to either total shoulder or reverse shoulder replacement as their backup option. So I think I would consider it uh, most in that, yeah, 35 to 60 category. You might consider a hemi because it does give them that enhanced range of motion. And there are those other little factors, like we, we showed a case where they, they already had a reverse on the other side. So one side is already limited with respect to rotation in a reasonable elevation as a reverse gives you. But you may think twice about putting another reverse on the other side to limit their motion for things like hygiene and you know toileting and things. You may may consider a hemi for that uh, in that case. Do you think there are enough long-term outcome studies that look at hemi arthroplasty for these age for this particular age group, say 35 to 60? Do you think there are enough outcome studies for hemi arthroplasty? No, they're they're quite limited. I, I think you're quite right there because it's a uh, very rare situation. You don't get it too often. It's a high trauma. Um, but there are some that have suggested they, they do survive quite well. And the issue with an alternative like reverse shoulder replacement is the survivability is still a little suspect at seven to 10 years. You know, the deltoid may wear out. There's complications of any arthroplasty of wear and loosening and osteolysis and things like that. So it's just not something we're eager to do. If you can avoid polyethylene in a young patient, some of the, these hemis can, can last quite a while. And you always have that as backup uh, it, with the new modular stems. In particular, it can be a very simple revision surgery to replace the head, convert it into a reverse, and uh, let them have another 10 to 20 years of, of benefit from their secondary operation. Now, you mentioned about the higher proportion of patients undergoing reverse total shoulder off in the last decade. So do you think the complication rates are going to be higher when a reverse shoulder is done for a fracture when compared with the rotator cuff tear arthropathy, which is the classic indication? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Uh, the best results for reverse are rotator cuff arthropathy. Uh, or even with some of the rotator cuff maintained, it can be even better. So in a proximal humeral fracture situation, the results are worse. You know, they're, they're, the complications are greater. You may 
had the potential to achieve the same outcomes from a patient reported perspective or clinical range of motion and strength, but there's a higher risk of dislocations, you know, infections, just the hematoma risk, things like that are definitely higher with the proximal humeral fracture. And there may be a tendency, it's, it's simpler to do compared to a hemi, because with the hemi, you must pay very close attention to those two porosities and fixing them carefully and positioning them, lots of suture work uh, and things like that versus the reverse. You can bring the two porosities down, but there may be a tendency for surgeons to think that, uh, you know, the two porosities aren't as important because you're using a reverse. They may be less careful than they would be with a hemi. Um, so the rise of it uh, may reflect the ease of doing a reverse uh, compared to a hemi. Now, if we say that uh, we try to preserve the humeral head at every possible scenario, for example, unless there's a head split, and uh, we try to resort to remote shoulder only at the last moment, because it's kind of a salvage, isn't it? So mm -hmm. can we say that we should try to preserve the original femoral head, like what you said, I mean, the humeral head, like what you said, by using cages or like using an intramedullary fibula or, I mean, what a, a strut graft, or something like that, and reserve, reserve, uh, reverse total shoulder only to those particular group of uh, patients, and also the surgeon experience, like someone who does a lot of reverse shoulders, I mean, per year, undertaking that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right, and kind of the point of the whole talk is that we have to consider all those factors. So for me, as a shoulder surgeon, comfortable with reverse shoulder arthroplasty, if I have an elderly low-demand patient, I would probably go to the reverse immediately uh, because you want to give them one surgery. There's not there's not much of a point in trying to preserve uh, potentially their their head um, and then risk um, you know hardware complication from a plate cage fibular strut longer surgery um, and then have a secondary operation for that individual. But if you drift down a bit to 60 to 70 maybe you don't want to do a reverse because that reverse may not last them. They may start failing at 70. If, they, if you do it at 60, they may have complications at 70. So there we're going to try to preserve the head, maybe give them fixation. And then like, as you suggest, use the, the reverse as your salvage option. So that's why the, this, this uh, fracture pattern is so challenging and so interesting really to treat you a lot of options and a lot of factors to consider. It's much easier, uh, and the lower extremity version of this injury, a hip fracture is much more uh, algorithmic that a, you know, a simple learning algorithm can look at an x-ray almost and tell you what you need to do. You know, femoral neck, you know, over 60, 65 gets a, a arthroplasty, younger people get it fixed, intertroch gets a nail, and then that's it. You know, you don't have to consider so much about all these other factors. So, so it keeps it interesting for us uh, up in the shoulder at least. And do you use the carbon fiber plates often? Because I, I saw in some of the x-rays the plates were invisible. So those were carbon fibers, isn't it? Um, no, those just were without plates. The just no the plates. cage alone, no plate. Yeah, I don't use the carbon fiber um, plates, but I know, I know they're available, but I haven't used Is there them. a trend to use carbon fiber plates across the US? Um, I haven't seen that. I think that there's had some issues that, you know, when you see one of those fail, it's it can be quite complicated. So titanium is quite reliable. And I haven't seen a large tendency to drift to carbon fiber plates. Okay, I think Dr. Srikumaran, that's all the questions that we have. Thank you for this fantastic session. The lectures have always been so unique. And uh, I mean, it's going to benefit a lot of people. Thank you so much for coming in again. And we look forward for the next lecture from your side. All right, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Take Thank care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.